Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good evening, as the case might be. Very sorry for the delay. It's only two. Well, it's it's late. It's later than uh, we had hoped, uh, for which I'm I'm very sorry. Uh, before we begin, let me just say uh, a brief word about someone you all know well. Uh, Nick Barnett has been the director of the press office for nearly two years now. That means for nearly two years. Uh, Nick has been dealing with all of you day in, day out, uh, beyond thanking him for his service. I think uh, that may actually call for uh, beatifying him uh, for all that he has done. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, his service uh, in this role is coming to an end uh, tomorrow as he transitions to his next assignments in the Foreign Service. Uh, from the start of this administration, no one has done more uh, than Nick to help revitalize uh, to help run our daily public affairs operations. Uh, he helps get me up to speed. He's continued to work with me every uh, single day to make sure I stay on the, on the right path. Uh, that in and of itself is, is no easy feat. Uh, and so just as we bid farewell to Nick and to thank Nick for, for everything uh, that he has done, uh, I want to welcome uh, Jennifer McCune. Uh, Jennifer uh, is, uh, will assume the role of uh, director of the press office uh, starting on <laughs> Monday. Uh, she joins us from CENTCOM, where she served as uh, the foreign policy advisor to the commander. Prior to that, uh, she served in the office of the vice president as a foreign policy advisor. She served overseas as well including as our deputy spokesperson in London, and prior to that, uh, as a special assistant to then deputy uh, secretary uh, of state, Antony Blinken. Uh, so she is no stranger to uh, this building. She is no stranger to our operations. She is no stranger uh, to many of you, and I know all of you uh, will enjoy working with her and getting to know her. So again, thank you, Nick. Welcome, Jen. Uh, and with that, oh, turn it over to Matt. Nothing else? Nothing else? Okay, well, uh, I'm not quite sure about sainthood for Nick. But, uh, I don't know, know Matt. You were, uh... he, comes he comes close. I mean, the, the number of times that I called him at like, you know, 6 a.m. were you know, frequent. But uh, anyway, thank you, Nick, and uh, welcome, uh, Jennifer. Uh, I, I have a couple things. One, just because of the, the way we are these days, can you fill us in on the Secretary's contacts with the President for the last couple of days, simply because of the COVID diagnosis. Sure. Uh, let me say a couple of things on that. First, uh, the Secretary is tested regularly. He was tested uh, again this morning. Uh, you all may have seen him this morning. Of course, the fact that he is here uh, indicates that he uh, tested negative. He feels just, he, he feels just fine. Um, he was last with uh, the president on Tuesday. Um, I, it is also the case that the secretary uh, tested positive for COVID in May. Uh, that is within the 90-day window where, according to the CDC, it is unlikely uh, that he would contract COVID due to his combination of immunity from his recent infection, uh, as well as the four doses of COVID-19 vaccine that he has received uh, over the past 18 months or so. So he will continue um, to test regularly, um, but okay. he's feeling and well. He is not, uh, he, he wasn't in close proximity or was not in close contact with the president. You, you heard from the White House press secretary I, and- No, I, I didn't. Uh, the, the, the White House press secretary, the White House announced that the White House medical unit is doing contact tracing uh, and that the White House medical unit will be in touch with any uh, and close contacts. Been, As of earlier today, I'm not aware that he has been uh, contacted. And, by the White House and then secondly, and I'm sorry if this is a little bit flip given all the serious nature, but uh, given the fact that the secretary does have a, um, a, a senior, if honorary, position with the Kennedy Center, I'm going to be very curious to know hear his explanation as to why it has taken so long for Gladys Knight to be recognized. Uh, so, hey, I, 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 sus please, I suspect, please, Matt, put, please put that, please put that to I, I suspect, Matt, on this, uh, the secretary will, uh, will agree with you. Okay, John. Um, well, first of all, also wanted to express my thanks to Nick. It's been great working with him on behalf of the, the association. Um, so we'll miss him, but look forward to working with Jennifer as well. Um, could I, I know you've been asked this before, um, in a different context, but, uh, Speaker Pelosi, um, the, the president uh, himself, he made some remarks to reporters last night saying that the military has concerns about her visiting Taiwan. Um, 
she was asked about it today and of course said she didn't have anything to announce. But is that is that a concern that's shared by the State Department, by, by U.S. diplomacy, about a potential visit to Taiwan by the Speaker? Well, Thon, it's not for me to speak to any potential travel the Speaker may or may not make. In fact, I saw a statement from her office making clear uh, that her office, as a matter of course, does not confirm or deny potential travel uh, before it takes place. So uh, this remains a hypothetical. We'll need to defer to the Speaker's office in, in the first instance uh, to speak to any uh, plans that they may have. Yes. Um, so what the President said, uh, is it official stance of this administration? Would you advise Speaker Pelosi against her visit? I'm not going to be offering any advice from this podium, uh, in part because uh, any travel, potential travel, remains a hypothetical. Uh, whether it is this question or any other question, I have a practice of not entertaining hypotheticals. Uh, if and when uh, the Speaker's office, or any other member for that matter, uh, were to announce travel, uh, we'd be in a position to speak to something then, but that day is not today. But you do have coordination with the, uh, with, with the Pentagon and also with the Speaker's office. Well, we work closely with Congress across uh, the full range of issues. Uh, we uh, have policy discussions. We have logistical discussions. Uh, we do have discussions about how to best achieve our shared uh, goals. Uh, the fact is that Congress is a separate and co-equal uh, branch of government. Uh, we ensure that uh, across every issue, Congress is informed of uh, what we're doing, and it is a uh, close and continuing dialogue uh, across all issues of concern. And just uh, one lastly on Taiwan. Uh, yesterday, the Chinese ambassador to the United States, Qing Gang, he blasted your one China policy. Basically, he's saying that the United States is hollowing out, blurring out the one China policy. Uh, what's your response to that? Uh, our position is that uh, our one China policy uh, continues uh, to be the policy we follow. Uh, we are guided, that one China policy, our one China policy, is guided by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint uh, communiques, and the six assurances. Uh, under the rubric of our one China policy, we are committed uh, to maintaining cross-strait peace and stability. Uh, we don't have, as you know, diplomatic relations uh, with Taiwan or support Taiwan independence. Uh, but we have a robust unofficial relationship uh, as well as an abiding interest in maintaining peace and stability uh, across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I wanted to get your response to the, um, uh, the Ukrainian grain uh, talks. The, the UN brokered a uh, deal that Turkey says is going to be signed tomorrow. Um, you know, what, what's your take on, on the, what, you know, the hope, how hopeful are you that this will resolve uh, the issue? Um, what are you still looking out for in terms of you know, what needs to be done to make sure that this, um, this is followed through? Well, we would welcome any such agreement. Uh, we applaud the hard work of the UN Secretary General. We applaud uh, the diligent work of our Turkish allies. Uh, this is something that uh, not only the United States has called for, in fact, Secretary Blinken uh, called for it most recently in the context of uh, the G20 ministerial in Bali earlier this month. Uh, it is something that, uh, for which we were joined by uh, other members uh, of the G20, other members of the international uh, community. The fact is that to date, Russia has weaponized uh, food during this conflict. Uh, they have destroyed agricultural facilities. They prevented uh, millions of tons of Ukrainian grain from getting to, to those who need it. Uh, as I said, we welcome the announcement of this agreement in principle, but what we're focusing on now uh, is holding Russia accountable for implementing uh, this agreement and for enabling uh, Ukrainian grain to get to world markets. It has been far too long that Russia has enacted uh, this blockade. Uh, it is uh, a reflection of Russia's wanton disregard uh, for lives and livelihoods, not only in the region, but well beyond uh, that we even had to reach this point. Uh, so what we'll be looking forward to uh, and uh, holding Russia accountable to is the implementation uh, and grain, most importantly, uh, leaving Ukrainian ports. Can we follow up on that? Sure. Um, 
to what, to what extent was the United States involved in these discussions? Obviously, it was Turkey and Secretary General Guterres. But is, what was the U.S. kept abreast of this, and how much detail do you have on this? Is it are you sure that's going to be a substantive agreement? How much de level of detail does the United States have on it? Well, uh, this is uh, very early going. Of course, reports have uh, just emerged, but I can say that. Uh, throughout these discussions, we have supported the UN Secretary General. Uh, we have supported our Turkish allies. We, have, of course, supported our uh, Ukrainian partners uh, in their efforts in this as well. We've been briefed by the UN at various stages. Uh, our experts have uh, compared notes and shared notes uh, with their experts. Uh, the same goes with uh, our Turkish allies and our Ukrainian partners. Again, uh, we should never have been in this position in the first place. This was a deliberate decision on the part of the Russian Federation to weaponize food. Uh, what we have heard within the past uh, couple of hours uh, is a welcome development, but what will really matter is the implementation of this uh, agreement. We, uh, of course, will continue to uh, work with our partners to hold Russia accountable uh, for its implementation. Yes. There are reports that there's new pressure from Congress for Secretary Blinken to designate Russia a state sponsor of terrorism, and that if he doesn't, Congress is just going to do it themselves. Is the State Department thinking about designating Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism? And is it worried that if it does do that, that there will be drawbacks down the line if it gets to the point of negotiations? So let me make a couple broad uh, points on this, some of which uh, may well be uh, self-evident. First. It goes without saying, uh, but in all cases, we are obligated to follow the law. Uh, and when it comes to the state sponsor of terrorism statute, the criteria against which the secretary must make such a determination, those criteria are, because they're in statute, they are defined by Congress. And so our task is to take the criteria that Congress has written into law and to compare that to the facts on the ground, uh, whether it's the SST statute or any other authority available to us. Uh, that's what we've done throughout the course uh, of this war. That's what we're doing uh, as part of our fulfillment uh, of our pledge, of the pledge that we've made with many of our closest allies and partners around the world uh, to impose massive costs and massive consequences uh, on Russia. Uh, there's another relevant data point here, and that is the fact that we have aligned and remained aligned with more than 30 countries across four continents on our multilateral sanctions, uh, as well as export controls and, and other measures. Uh, we have additionally curtailed uh, international uh, assistance and foreign aid. Uh, in short, the costs that we've imposed uh, on Russia are in line uh, with the consequences of an SST designation. Uh, more broadly, uh, we have worked with partners to methodically eject Russia from uh, the international economic order, uh, to deny Moscow the privileges and benefits it once enjoyed. That includes its most favored nation trading status uh, and its borrowing privileges from international financial institutions. Uh, we also restricted Russia's ability to uh, access its frozen central bank funds uh, to make debt payments. So all told, these unprecedented set of measures, they're having a drastic impact on Russia's economy and on Russia's financial system. You can look at any number of metrics. Russia's stock market uh, has lost a third of its value. Inflation is rising up to 20%. Russia's GDP is forecasted to uh, decline by some 15%. Russia's imports of goods from around the world could fall by uh, 40%. Uh, it was recently reported that uh, due to uh, the pressure of the U.S. and our, our partners, Russia defaulted on its foreign currency and debt uh, for the first time in quite a while. Uh, and just this month, um, or just within recent weeks, uh, we announced additional actions together with our uh, G7 partners to target, Russia, to target Russia's military supply chains, to ban the import of Russian uh, gold, which is Russia's uh, second largest export behind uh, energy, uh, and to explore ways with a price cap to push down the revenue uh, that President Putin is uh, in a position to accrue uh, from energy generation. Uh, so as we always do, uh, we will follow the law, we will examine the facts, uh, and we will take uh, the steps in accordance with the law and the facts to continue to hold Russia accountable. If we're going to talk about this issue 
like every day. Can I just ask, is the administration's position that Cuba still meets the legal requirements to be a state sponsor? So in every case, when the United States over the years, over the course of administrations, just, just yes or no. uh, over the course of administrations, do you believe that it still meets the, the, the criteria? The, the, uh, the fact pattern uh, that led a previous administration to uh, designate well, Cuba as a state and, sponsor and, of terrorism is, is in the public record. And, it is in the public record. And, and, and an, uh, an administration before that to remove it, right? Sorry. So, so what, what is what so is this Matt, administration? This this gets back to the point that we are always examining the facts and applying them against the law. So are that you applies that, a that, now that, that, that applies now? equally to Ukraine as it does to Cuba as it does to North well, Korea. Ukraine, I wasn't aware that Ukraine was. <laughs> Excuse me, Russia. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, okay. well, uh, Russia. So are you saying that there's an active? Uh, an active look at whether uh, at taking Cuba off the list. I'm I'm not saying that, Matt. But uh, our charge with all statutes, with all with all authorities, uh, is to ensure that we're using those authorities uh, appropriately, uh, consistent with the facts and consistent with the law. Nazira. Uh, do you have any update uh, about the U.S. relationship with the Taliban? Because Taliban would like to compromise with the United States. And number two, a uh, lot of Afghan. Your friends, the people who work with the United States, they would like to come to the United States. The process is very slow. Any new idea to bring them or give them a more facility to process get uh, expedited? So, Nazira, in terms of uh, engagement with uh, the Taliban, we spoke about this uh, a few days ago, but late last month, our special yeah. representative for Afghanistan, Tom West, had an opportunity to uh, lead a delegation accompanied by a senior Treasury Department official, a senior USA, uh, USAID uh, uh, official uh, to Doha, uh, which was at the time the first in-person engagement with a high-level Taliban representative uh, since the Taliban's uh, egregious decision on March 23rd uh, to limit the ability of girls to attend uh, secondary education. Uh, we made clear as we do uh, in all of our engagements with them, that the United States expects the Taliban uh, to uphold the commitments they've made to the international community, uh, but even more so in some ways, the commitments that they have to the Afghan people. Uh, the decision uh, we made clear, uh, our stark uh, opposition to uh, that decision that was announced on March 23rd, a decision that is inconsistent uh, with the commitments that the Taliban has to uh, the Afghan people. Uh, this is an area where our special envoy, um, Rina Amiri, has also been deeply engaged, uh, working with uh, our like-minded partners uh, around the world to use the tools that are available uh, to us whether that is humanitarian assistance, um, whether that is um, uh, uh, tools at the UN um, to not only hold the Taliban accountable, uh, but to support the people of Afghanistan and their humanitarian needs. And also there was another report, John Dobinson, Jay Dobinson, uh, former uh, US representative in Afghanistan and Pakistan a week ago, he, uh, now he is member of Iran Cooperation. He said that United States should compromise with the Taliban. Otherwise, there is no solution uh, to Taliban to open even the school for women and bring the peace. Uh, do you think that Iran cooperation uh, exports uh, idea is going to be useful? You guys listen to them? Nazir, I, I haven't seen that particular report, but what I can say more broadly is that there is no compromise. Uh, when it comes to the basic commitments uh, that the Taliban has put forward uh, in private, that the Taliban has put forward in public, uh, and even more importantly, that the Taliban has made to its own people. Uh, these are in some ways very simple commitments, respecting the basic rights of all of the people of Afghanistan. It's women, it's girls, it's minorities, it's religious minorities. Uh, respecting the right of free passage uh, for those who seek to leave, uh, upholding its counterterrorism commitments, uh, including in the context of uh, Al-Qaeda, including in the context uh, of the ISIS branch, uh, in 
Afghanistan, uh, forging a government that is representative of the Afghan people. Uh, and when it comes to our concerns, uh, we are committed to the proposition that we cannot have a normal relationship with any entity uh, that continues to hold an American citizen, in this case, Mark Frerichs, hostage. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ned. A cargo plane which crashed in northern Greece last Sunday was carrying 11 tons of weapons, including landmine, to Bangladesh from Serbia. And Greece asking for explanation to Serbia. So what is your comment on that? And the US is doing an investigation as eight Ukrainian crews or members have died. Uh, I'm not aware that we have any role uh, in the investigation. If we do have a role, um, we will uh, uh, we can follow up with you. Um, but on this question, I, I would need to defer to uh, Greek and Serbian and Bangladeshi authorities. Yes. Um, yesterday, uh, Annette, the Belgian Parliament approved a treaty on prisoner swap with Iran, and this is after, in February, Iran um, detained a Belgian citizen, and just recently, Belgium um, convicted a former Iranian diplomat of uh, planning to carry out an attack on an opposition group in, in Paris. Um, do you, does the Biden administration think that this is a good course of action to exchange, to bring back uh, their detained citizens, especially when the other side uh, for Iran is, uh, would be a diplomat and has the tag of a terrorist? So, Gita, uh, I'll refer you to the government of Belgium, uh, Belgium to uh, comments on developments uh, within their own system. But let me make uh, a couple broader points. Um, Number one, Iran has a long history of unjust imprison imprisonment of foreign nationals uh, for use as political leverage. Uh, Iran continues to engage uh, in a range of human rights abuses. Uh, that includes large-scale arbitrary uh, or unlawful detention of individuals, uh, many of whom have uh, faced torture and execution after unfair trials. Uh, these practices are outrageous. Iran continues to hold uh, Americans. Iran continues to hold third country nationals unjustly, wrongfully. It remains uh, a priority of this administration and will continue to be a priority uh, of this administration to see to it uh, that the Americans are released uh, and that we will continue to work together uh, with our partners uh, to address uh, Iran's heinous practice of wrongfully detaining third country nationals as well. Could this be a course of action for the United States as you are talking uh, with Iran about those uh, U.S. dual nationals in, uh, in Iran alongside the JCPOA? Well, as I said, we and our allies are committed to doing everything we can to see to it that our respective nationals are reunited with their families. In too many cases, these individuals have been separated from their families uh, from uh, for years. Um, Put this way, we have uh, twin imperatives. Again, first and foremost, it is seeing the release uh, of our nationals. Uh, at the same time, uh, we want to, and we are working to underscore, to reinforce uh, the norm against this heinous practice. Uh, that's why Secretary Blinken has commended uh, Canada for its leadership in obtaining international support for what's known as the uh, Declaration Against Arbitrary Det Detention and State-to-State -State Relations. Uh, we've called on like-minded countries around the world to work together uh, to pressure nations, including Iran in this case, that engage in detentions, uh, such detentions, to put an end to this practice and to release those detained under, under such conditions. I'm sure questions on the JCPOA. Um, the British, uh, the chief of the British intelligence agency today said at the Aspen Institute that he doesn't believe Khamenei has made a decision to cut a deal. Um, has that opinion been shared with the United States? And um, the British ambassador to Iran today has, a, has visited one of the provinces um, the Chamber of Commerce with their own delegation, and in a tweet he says that plenty of great companies in Fars province with opportunities for quality UK products and services to boost UK-Iran trade, JCPOA or not. Does this mean that Britain might go its own way 
given whatever the fate of the uh, the talks. So on your first question, uh, Gita, it is no secret that the United States and our British partners have an extraordinarily close intelligence sharing relationship. It's not for me to speak to the contents of that relationship, but I also don't think you need a security clearance uh, to discern the fact uh, that Iran at this point doesn't seem to have made the political decision or decisions, I should say, uh, necessary uh, to achieve a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA. The fact is that a deal has been on the table for months now. Uh, we have continued to engage in indirect diplomacy uh, with Iran, courtesy of uh, the efforts of the European Union and other partners. Uh, but Iran, to this point at least, uh, has not displayed an inclination uh, to seek that deal. So uh, certainly, uh, those comments ring true. Uh, on your second question, look, uh, the UK is uh, and has, has always been a member of the P5 plus one. The UK is also committed to uh, the principle that President Biden has reiterated and underlined, uh, namely that Iran must not be able to acquire uh, a nuclear weapon. Our sanctions will remain in place unless and until uh, there is a mutual return to compliance with uh, the JCPOA, uh, and I fully expect uh, our allies uh, around the world, uh, including our close allies in the context of the P5 plus one, uh, will continue uh, to maintain strong pressure, economic, financial pressure on Iran, uh, unless and until Iran changes course. He's saying that we're going to do business no matter what, uh, evil or no deal. Well, again, I can't speak for these specific comments, but I can speak uh, for our airtight cooperation uh, with the UK in the context of the P5 plus one, in the context uh, of our joint and shared efforts uh, to achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA. So kind of on this same thing, I, and I hesitate to ask you for any kind of analysis from the podium, but um, is there any concern that two of the G7 leaders who the president met with just a couple of weeks ago um, gone now um, and, and and any concern that that will impact um, broader G7 uh, cooperation or broader G7 policy <laughs> directed at Russia, Ukraine, China? Uh, I think the only um, small bit uh, that I will wade into this is to say that uh, each both of these cases uh, were predicated upon unique circumstances, uh, and I'm not going to uh, go beyond that except to say that uh, our alliance uh, with the UK, our alliance with uh, Italy, again, uh, is predicated uh, not on personalities, not on political parties, um, but on decades of shared interests, shared values. Uh, we won't comment on government formation or uh, domestic politics within either context, but uh, I am confident that uh, when um, leadership, uh, when new leadership potentially emerges in both countries, uh, that they will continue to be stalwart partners in the context uh, of the G7, in the context of our shared uh, and collective challenges right. around the globe. But, but, but surely your people in Rome and in, in London are, you know, checking out possibilities for and is there any concern that uh, the new leadership might be less uh, inclined to support the what, what has been the G7 Western position? This coalition and there are a number of coalitions that have come together uh, including on the challenge of Russia Ukraine uh, has proven remarkably resilient. I think I said yesterday that it has defied expectations uh, long before this, the advent of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, on February 24th, we are confident in the strength, we're confident in the durability uh, of this coalition uh, and uh, of the commitment uh, on the part of our allies and partners uh, to continue to support Ukraine uh, and to continue to hold Russia to account. Yes. And uh, is there a study to go back to Doha to uh, negotiate uh, with Iran uh, regarding the JCPOA, especially that uh, 
Qatari foreign minister has uh, a friend conversation today with his uh, Iranian counterpart, uh, who said that uh, they are ready to go back to the agreement uh, and to put the ball uh, in the U.S. Uh, field. Uh, the uh, short summary of the Iranian statement uh, to us, unfortunately, sounds like more of the same. Uh, rather than put this in the context of going back to Doha, let me say that the United States uh, and our partners within the P5 plus one uh, are uh, committed uh, to the course of a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA, uh, but the key adjective there is mutual. Uh, to date, we have not seen any indication uh, that Iran is ready uh, or uh, willing at this stage uh, to return to the JCPOA. As I said before, a deal has been on the table for months now. Uh, if Iran wanted to avail itself of that deal, uh, it has had any number of opportunities in Vienna, in Doha, uh, through our uh, partners in the Middle East, through our partners uh, in the EU. Iran, again to date, uh, has chosen not to do so. But are you ready to go back to Doha for a new we are fully prepared to uh, return to uh, mutual compliance with the JCPOA. I think uh, it is uh, uh, probably more appropriate to focus on uh, our overarching goal rather than the tactic to get there. Uh, we continue to believe uh, that diplomacy is the most uh, durable approach to contain Iran's nuclear program. We continue uh, to believe that within that diplomatic rubric, a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA uh, is the most effective, uh, is the most feasible uh, option that has been within reach for quite some time now uh, to reapply uh, those stringent limits on Iran's nuclear program, uh, to reimpose uh, the most uh, stringent verification and monitoring regime ever peacefully negotiated, uh, and in the case of Iran, uh, to see to it that um, appropriate sanctions relief is applied if Iran once again uh, uh, curtails its its nuclear activity. Two more things. Uh, one, uh, U.S. lawmakers uh, sent a letter to Secretary Blinken uh, noting their concerns about uh, Israel's designation of six Palestinian NGOs as terrorist groups. Uh, do you have anything on this uh, letter? Uh, you know that we don't comment on uh, congressional correspondence. I'm, I'm familiar with it, but let me just say uh, we've made clear uh, to our Israeli government uh, and Palestinian Authority and counterparts that independent civil society organizations in the West Bank and in Israel must be able to continue their important work. Uh, we value the monitoring of human rights violations and abuses that these independent NGOs uh, undertake in this region and around the world. Uh, and we strongly believe that respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms uh, and a strong civil society are critically important to responsible, responsive, and democratic uh, governance around the world. Uh, and I made this point yesterday, but I'll make it again. Um, we have designated the PFLP as a, uh, as a uh, foreign terrorist organization for uh, more than 20 years now, going on 30 years. It's an SGGT as well. It remains designated today. Uh, when it comes to these six NGOs, we've not designated uh, any of them, but neither have we funded uh, these groups. And one uh, more on Iraq. Uh, the Iraqi authorities have asked uh, Turkey to withdraw from uh, Iraq territories, and uh, they will uh, ask the Security Council uh, to do so. Uh, will you support uh, Iraq in this demand? Uh, this is um, uh, a question for the government of Iraq. Uh, for our part, you heard this from us uh, yesterday. We uh, uh, reaffirm our position uh, in support of Iraqi sovereignty, uh, in support of Iraq's uh, territorial integrity, um, but would need to refer to uh, our partners in Iraq on that question. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions on behalf of a couple of colleagues who, who aren't here. Um, one is uh, apparently Secretary Blinken met this morning with uh, Afghanivac. It's a nonprofit uh, that's trying to bring interpreters out of Afghanistan. I'm um, wondering if there's anything you'd say about it. Um, did you make any additional commitments, uh, any assurances on speeding up processing or relocation? Sure. Uh, you have heard us say for uh, the better part of a year now uh, that the United States has an enduring commitment not only to the people of Afghanistan, uh, but of course to 
American citizens to lawful permanent residents, um, some 1,300 of whom uh, we have uh, helped transport uh, out of Afghanistan over the course of uh, the past year, but uh, also to uh, Afghans to whom we have a special commitment. Uh, and today, uh, as part of a, a regular engagement, the Secretary met with uh, representatives of a self-organized coalition of more than 180 organizations, including veterans, frontline civilians, social workers, attorneys, nonprofits, congressional staff, and private sector employees, all of whom uh, we uh, have worked with to support relocation uh, and resettlement of our Afghan allies and partners over uh, the better part of a year now. Uh, the meeting was part of the department's ongoing collaboration with this uh, coalition uh, and a recognition of the commitment that uh, we have as a country uh, made to supporting our new Afghan neighbors. The secretary during the course uh, of this meeting today, he's now met with this coalition uh, multiple times, but today he listened to stories uh, of Afghans beginning their new lives here in the United States. Uh, the coalition we think represents um, the extraordinary contributions uh, of individuals and communities across the country uh, that are helping to make good on that commitment that we have to our Afghan allies, uh, including by uh, welcoming tens of thousands of them uh, into our community. Yes. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, just something completely unrelated um, on behalf of a colleague. Uh, apparently, there's a State Department employee who was killed yesterday in a bicycle mm -hmm. near, the, near the, the building. Is there anything you can offer on that? I, I, I can confirm uh, that a, a Foreign Service officer, Sean O'Donnell, um, uh, was uh, 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 killed yesterday. Um, we extend our deepest condolences uh, to her family, uh, to her loved ones. Uh, we need to refer you to the Metropolitan Police Department uh, for additional information. Sorry to hear about that. So Ukraine's state nuclear company has accused Russia of storing explosives uh, within the heart of one of its active plants, the largest atomic energy center in Europe. If, is this something the State Department is investigating? And if verified, what kind of response might we expect to see given the potential for a widespread catastrophe? So I'm not immediately familiar with, with those reports. Uh, we have spoken in the past of Russia's irresponsible behavior uh, in the vicinity of Ukraine's nuclear, uh, uh, nuclear uh, power generation facilities. Um, if we have anything particularly on this, on this angle, we'll let you know. Yes. Um, Turkish President Erdogan has said that his country is considering um, an offensive campaign in northern Syria. So I'm wondering what you think about this news, and also is the administration reconsidering its sale of F-16 jets to Turkey in light of this development? Uh, so we spoke yesterday um, uh, regarding the uh, importance and the concern uh, that we've expressed regarding the stated um, uh, plans for an incursion in northeastern Syria by Turkish forces. Uh, it is important to us that existing ceasefire lines be preserved. Uh, any new uh, operation, uh, any new uh, Turkish offensive uh, in the region would have the potential uh, to set back some of the tremendous progress that uh, the coalition has made in, uh, in the face of uh, Daesh's so-called uh, caliphate in recent years, uh, it would have the potential uh, to be detrimental in the context of the ongoing uh, political process uh, pursuant to UN Security Council Resolution uh, 2254. Uh, we have expressed this concern publicly, as we did again yesterday and today. Uh, we have expressed it uh, privately uh, with our uh, Turkish allies uh, as well. Um, when it comes to F-16s, uh, we made the point, and you heard this from the president in the aftermath of his bilateral meeting with uh, President Erdogan of, of Turkey uh, on the sidelines of the NATO summit uh, earlier uh, in, in June. Uh, we strongly value our partnership with uh, Turkey. Turkey is an important NATO ally. Uh, we in Turkey have longstanding, deep uh, and, and long-standing and deep bilateral defense ties uh, and Turkey's continued uh, NATO interoperability remains a priority for us uh, as a matter of policy. We don't publicly comment or confirm pro proposed defense transfers uh, until they've been for formally notified to Congress. Uh, but what I can say is that we continue uh, to engage uh, Congress on, on this question. Yes. Just a clarification, uh, Ned, I have heard you say many times that used the, the term ceasefire lines. Could you just 
B minus, where those lines fall, and when was that ceasefire between whom and whom? And whom? Because I have been following the case, and I, have, and I don't remember that Turkey, Tur Turkey has signed or anything with IPG in that sense. Uh, so uh, our position has long been that uh, we support the maintenance of current ceasefire lines. We condemn any escalation. Uh, of course, I don't have a, a map uh, in, in front of me, uh, but uh, we also uh, expect Turkey to live up to the joint statement that it signed on October 17th, 2019, uh, including uh, as part of that joint statement to halt operations in Northeast Syria. Uh, we've consistently said that we recognize Turkey's legitimate security concerns. No other NATO ally uh, has faced as many terrorist attacks uh, as our uh, Turkish allies, uh, but any new offensive would run the risk of further undermining uh, stability, would have put uh, U.S. forces and the coalition's campaign against ISIS uh, potentially at risk. So you say there is a ceasefire line that is like, even if you don't have a map in front of you, there is a line where Turkey and United States or whoever agreed that it will not pass one. Second thing, you are talking about a joint statement in 2019. That joint statement was about the Turkey's ending its operation in the current, like the uh, peace spring operation. It is. It doesn't give any commitment that it will not launch another operation in another part of northern Syria. So, can you just clarify this point for us? You, you over and over mentioned that joint statement, does it say specifically that Turkey is not going to launch any other operation in northern Syria? As part of that joint statement from October of 2019, uh, it is our contention that Turkey uh, needs to halt offensive operations in northeast Syria. Uh, that is a point that successive administrations now have made, this administration and the last administration. Uh, but more broadly, we continue to support the maintenance of these current ceasefire lines Again, any uh, offensive uh, would put at risk some of the tremendous gains uh, that we've achieved together uh, in recent years. Is there, is, there, is there a line, like really, between the United States and Turkey, a line that really physically that you are not going to go from here to there? I'm just trying to ask, ceasefire line, what do you mean by that? Uh, existing uh, current ceasefire lines. Yes. Um, there's a report coming out saying that 60 U.S. officials were sent to quarantine in China against their will. Can you confirm that? I am not immediately familiar with that, but we'll get back to you. Yes. Uh, just one more. On um, Lavrov, uh, he's uh, addressing the Arab League on Sunday. I know, as we saw in the G20 um, and in other places, we've, the United States has been, has been able to isolate Russia. Mm -hmm. Is there any concern that he's going to address the Arab League? Has there been any discussion with the Arab League about his appearance? As I said before, uh, we are less concerned with whom uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, and his colleagues uh, are communicating uh, and uh, more focused on the messages that they're hearing. And when it comes to the G20 in Bali, and you alluded to this, uh, the message that Foreign Minister Lavrov heard was loud and clear. It was one in condemnation of Russia's illegal, unprovoked, unjustified, brutal uh, war against Ukraine. It was a message that uh, was largely in support uh, of our Ukrainian partners. It was a message uh, that was uh, nearly unanimous in its condemnation of what Russia has done when it comes to global food security. Uh, we understand that countries around the world have uh, individual, unique relations uh, with Russia. Uh, but there are basic principles at play that apply equally uh, in the Middle East, as they do to Europe, as they do uh, in the Indo-Pacific and everywhere else. Uh, those are the central tenets of the rules-based international system. Uh, the idea uh, that might in the 21st century can't make right, uh, the idea that a large country shouldn't be in a position to bully a small country, uh, the idea that no other country should uh, be able to dictate the foreign policy orientation or the foreign policy choices uh, of any other country. Those are principles uh, that we seek uh, to preserve and to promote, again, when it comes to the Middle East, in Europe, the Indo-Pacific, and everywhere else. Yes? Uh, the UK's intelligence chief said today that they predict Russia's military is about to hit a wall, run out of steam, uh, was the exact phrase, uh, giving Ukraine a chance to strike back. 
Does the U.S. share this assessment? What we are doing is putting Ukraine in the best position uh, to defend its territory against this naked aggression. Uh, that is what we have done well before uh, the start of Russia's invasion. Uh, after all, the first drawdown for uh, Ukraine was uh, nearly a year ago. It was, as I recall, Labor Day of last year. Uh, there was another $200 million drawdown uh, in December uh, of last year. And then uh, in the run up to, and of course, during the course of this, investiga of this invasion, uh, billions of dollars uh, worth of support to our Ukrainian partners uh, so that together with our partners around the world, uh, we can put Ukraine in the strongest possible position on the battlefield and by extension uh, in the strongest possible position uh, at the negotiating table if and when any such negotiating table develops. All right. Thank you all very much.